a new government. So we now have a president. Of course, there's the question right away. <laughs> One of the first things Congress has to figure out is what do they call the president? Um, in fact, John Adams actually wanted to call the president your highness. Washington was very much against this. Uh, remember, people were wanting to get away from monarchy and everything. So uh, grudgingly, they will eventually accept Mr. President. Uh, Washington was really uh, fascinating during this time period because he really wanted the presidency and the position of the presidency to be surrounded by respectability at all times. And so he's going to have these very, very strict rules for every sin single interaction he has with the public and he carries himself very much with stern resolve at all times so much so that people like actually comment that he's so stiff with his interactions a lot of times uh, the other thing that has to be taken care of right away now that the uh, constitution has been ratified is that whole bill of rights uh, james madison the representative from virginia is going to push a uh, speedy action on getting the Bill of Rights established. These, remember, would be the amendments on like personal liberties more than anything else um, that had been basically promised in turn for people to ratify the um, Constitution. Um, Madison really, like I said, keeps the focus on personal liberties more than anything else. The Bill of Rights is actually gonna be ratified on December 15th of 17, um, 1791 most of the time they are concerned with individual rights like religious freedom, uh, freedom of expression, and safeguarding individuals and their property against arbitrary legal proceedings. Only three of them actually talk about states' rights and everything. Uh, so the Ninth and the Tenth Amendment are both going to stipulate that the powers not granted to the national government and the Constitution are retained by the people and by the states. And then the other one that actually talks about state governments is the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment actually talks about having a well-regulated militia and basically for the right, the right for the people to keep and bear arms for that militia, basically as protection against federal tyranny. This, first of all, ties a whole lot into the whole American Revolution just happened where people literally took up arms against their government. And so it was kind of a continuance of that. Now, um, it's not until actually 2008 that the Supreme Court is going to interpret this um, amendment actually as a personal right to bear and keep arms. So kind of keep that in mind in this time period. Um, I always forget to point this out, and so I pulled it in here really quick. I want to just point out the age of a lot of these future delegates and presidents and just officials within the United States in 1776. Now, some of these are the youngest, some of the youngest ones like Marquis de Lafayette and James Monroe, who's a future president of the United States. Aaron Burr, we're going to talk about more. Alexander Hamilton, we're going to really talk about more in this PowerPoint. Um, giving you some other ages because there were some people that were older. So, for instance, like James Madison was 25 when he signed the Declaration of Independence. Uh, John Jay was 30. Jefferson was 33. Adams was 40. And Washington was actually 44. And the average age of the people who signed the Declaration of Independence was actually 44. So just I like to uh, showcase to all my students just the huge, broad range of ages actually that were involved in all of this and establishing a whole new government. So um, next you have the um, you have to set up all of the executive departments and the president is not just going to nominate public officials but they're um, keep in mind he nominates public officials that then have to be um, approved by the Senate. Uh, they have to confirm his appointments, but they're also going to, at this time, basically uh, figure out and say that the president also has the power to dismiss an official without the Senate's consent. Eventually, these department heads are going to evolve basically into the cabinet. So this would be things like the State Department over foreign affairs, uh, the Treasury over finances, the War Department over the nation's defense. And then we also have the judicial branch. Um, we're gonna have the Judiciary Act of 1789. This basically creates the hierarchical national judiciary. It was based off of having 13 
federal district courts, one for each state. And then from there, appeals from these courts would be heard in one of three circuit courts, although actually today, as you can see on this map, there's actually 11 circuit courts. And then from there, appeals would be um, put forward to the Supreme Court. Now, the thing is, the Supreme Court had a final say in these contested cases, but really the federal courts overall, they only have jurisdiction in legal issues stemming from the Constitution in regards to like laws and treaties of the national government. So this basically means state courts are going to continue to hear and rule on the vast majority of like civil and criminal cases. So if you are being found guilty of like murder and they're deciding if you were guilty or innocent, that's gonna be like at the state level. But if they're deciding if something in particular is considered illegal or legal, um, that starts being more uh, going towards the Constitution and everything there and changing an interpretation of this Constitution or adding an amendment to the Constitution and everything like that. And so that's when it starts going into that like federal territory. So um, an example would be like if someone today was convicted of, and I know it's small things, but um, like smoking weed, that if they actually smoked weed or didn't smoke weed, that is the legal and the criminal element of the case. And so that's gonna be at the state level. But then if they wanted to argue that, oh, this shouldn't be considered like illegal at all because of this and because the constitution says this. And if we look at president because of this, then it starts going into that territory of going into the federal judiciary branch, judicial branch really. Also, um, we have to set up basically the government's chief source of income at this time which is going to be a tariff on imported goods as well as tonnage duties, which are basically fees based off of cargo capacity. Um, this is going to set forth the Tariff Act of 1789. This was specifically designed to raise revenue, not to protect American manufacturers. I'm gonna talk about protection with tariffs in just a second, but I wanna talk about what this tariff actually is first. So basically this tariff is going to levy a duty of 5% on most imported goods, but it also would impose tariffs as high as like 50% on a limited number of items like steel, salt, cloth, and tobacco. Now this is gonna cause sectional sparring between the North and the South when it comes to the um, issue of protection for manufacturers be with uh, tariffs. The thing is tariffs do two things. A, they make revenue for the federal government. But the other thing a tariff does is it protects American markets. So for instance, if you were going to buy, let's say tobacco, and you looked at the price of tobacco in the United States and it was $11 a pound. And do not listen to these prices, I'm just trying to give you numbers so you can understand the concept. $11 a pound. And then you looked at the price of tobacco in France. And for some reason there, it was $10 a pound. You might decide to buy the French tobacco because it's cheaper. However, with the tariff, what that does is suddenly a tariff of 50% on the French tobacco makes the entire price be $15 a pound. Well, that's a lot more expensive than $11 a pound. So you end up buying the American tobacco. So this protects the manufacturers of tobacco, so to speak. However, and so a lot of northern areas really like this because there's a lot of manufacturing going on in the north and establishing themselves in the north. But a lot of areas in the south don't like it because they were the ones initially buying these manufactured goods. And what that means is no matter what the price of the item has increased and so they feel like it unfairly hurts their market versus like the north who is definitely going to get more out of it so we're going to see this um argument over manufactured goods and wanting to keep down the cost of manufactured goods is going to continue on and this is still a debate that goes through to today um feel free to be looking at like the whole tariff war that was going on um, and thinking about how this like kind of relates to that um, the tariff war that was going on more last year. 
And then we have Alexander Hamilton. The thing is, the treasury at this time was the largest and the most important of the new departments, and it is headed by Alexander Hamilton of New York. The biggest thing he has to handle is the immense amount of debt that is left over from the Revolutionary War. The problem is America, the federal government really couldn't borrow a lot of money because their credit was worthless <laughs> at that point in time. So Hamilton is going to prepare a series of reports on how him and others like have come together and how basically the debt should be managed. Now, these are his reports. Keep in mind, not all of these will go into effect. So the first report he makes is that he that is saying that the federal government should assume the remaining war debt from the state governments. And part of this is kind of going back to the, you know what we saw with the Articles of Confederation before that the nation's creditors would then have an economic stake in the stability of the new nation. Um, there's also part of this that they would let people lend money to the government at bonds for 4%. So it's a great way to, you know, make money to then pay off all that debt that the um, federal government is assuming. The second report is going to be the idea that there should be an excise tax. Now, an excise tax is basically the tax on the production, sale, or consumption of some specific commodity. And in this case, the idea was to put an excise tax on distilled whiskey that was produced in the United States. This, the purpose of this was basically to raise additional revenue for all the you know interest payments and debt and everything, but also it is twofold. By establishing this excise tax on whiskey, this is an internal federal tax. And so it's establishing the government's right to levy that internal tax. And so keep in mind, this would be the first time that people would be taxed not just at the state level, but also at the federal level. And that's a big deal. After all, taxing and stuff was the whole issue with the Revolutionary War, although that was partly because no taxation without representation and people would be represented in, well, some people would be represented in the federal government at the time. The third report was the idea that America should charter a national bank of the United States. Um, this is very much would have been patterned after the Bank of England. It would be jointly owned between the federal government as well as private investors. And it would serve as like a fiscal, financial, and depository agency of the government. And it would do things like make loan to businesses. And just having a national bank would provide the nation with a very stable currency. Making loan to businesses, this is important because it's another way that then the federal government could make money because if they make loans, people owe them back, they owe them interest on top of it, thus making revenue, helping paying off the debts and yada, yada, yada. And then the fourth report is that the government should take actions to promote industry within the United States. This would be things like increasing tariffs, not just to have high tariffs to make money, but also to have protective tariffs so that imported goods are more expensive than domestic goods in industries like iron, steel, and shoemaking that have already basically begun to establish themselves, especially in the northern regions. And uh, the other part of this would be like having the government give direct subsidies to assist with startup costs for like other industries. Oh, I mentioned the tariff war in the last one, um, but just kind of thinking about that again in regards. Keep in mind, though, they're, when you're looking, thinking about the tariff war um, that occurred more recently to then, um, the world economy today is very different from that time. However, <laughs> as much as um, Hamilton has these reports put forward, there were some people that were really concerned about this plan. Um, some were concerned that Hamilton's plan was unfair. Uh, for instance, going to that first report, assuming the state debts. The thing is, with the exception of South Carolina, the southern states had basically paid back all or most of their war debts. And so really, by having the federal government assume the debt of all of the states would help the northern states a lot more than the south. Because of this issue, they're gonna actually remain in deadlock on this particular report until the summer of 1790. Eventually a compromise is reached. Southerners would agree 
to allow the federal government to take over all of the, basically accept the funding in its original form and take over all of the state's debts. In exchange though, basically um, Hamilton is gonna line up Northern votes for where to locate the nation's permanent capital. They're going to set it up where it's going to be on the banks of the Potomac River and thus be surrounded by both the slave states of Maryland and Virginia and therefore be in the South. And that is why Washington DC is located where it is to this day. However, oh, we got a compromise on the first one. If we jump to the third one, um, immediately after Madison is actually going to lead congressional opposition to Hamilton's bank. The thing is most of the South saw the bank once again as evidence of willingness to sacrifice the interests of the agrarian South in favor for the financial and industrial interests of the North. Um, basically Southerners, including Madison, would argue that the constitution didn't authorize Congress to charter a bank. That being said, the bank bill is going to pass through Congress. However, even though the bank bill passed through Congress because there was such there were so many people that were against it. Washington was really concerned that the bank might not be constitutional. And actually this is when he calls together one of the first uh, big cabinet meetings to get all of his cabinet's opinions. And this is the first great big debate on how the, constitu the, how the constitution should be interpreted. Should it be a strict constructionist view that if the constitution doesn't have it in it, then no, the federal government cannot do it. Or should it be a broad constructionist view of, oh, the Constitution doesn't have it in it, but that doesn't mean they can't do it. Um, basically, that broad constructionist view is going to be the position that Hamilton takes, um, partly because he's going to interpret Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, which says to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper, as meaning that no, because they said it says they can make all laws that are necessary and proper, then we can make a bank of the United States. Um, he is going to win Washington to his side and the bank bill will be signed. The bank will be chartered for the next 20 years. Now, if you're going, wait a second, we don't have an official bank of the United States. You are correct in that. It's a lot more complicated than that today. Um, but keep in mind that this particular chartering of this bank is not what we have today. So you can imagine what's going to happen eventually. Um, going back to number two, though, on all of these um, reports, the excise tax on distilled whiskey, Congress is going to pass a healthy, actually 25% excise tax on distilled liquor. And then on that fourth report, um, actually very little of Hamilton's plan to promote manufacturing is going to survive. 